yeah, we got some magnesium deficiency. So again, avoid your high pH because you, when you have your high pH, your available magnesium uh, is going to be harder uh, for the plant to uptake and translocate. So this is, you know, some examples of what you're seeing as, uh, as you're kind of growing your crop uh, that would trigger you to think, oh man, you know, right now, I, maybe my pH is a little wonky. All right. It's a classic scenario in October when you start to see transitions to start to see this intervenal chlorosis, typically one or two leaves right below the turning bract. Now it's important to, to watch because it's tricky because in some cases in reds, this will kind of look like a transition bract. But you have to recognize this is clearly intervenal and it's going to be a little bit below where the bracts are. It's treatable if you catch it early, but if you don't treat it, that leaf is going to be permanently yellowed. Yeah, and it'll restore the rest of the growth as far as your bract development. Um, even, so like I said, even if, if you even if you correct it in the plant, it's going to be almost impossible to correct it in that leaf if you get like into early November, because that leaf is pretty much done and all the nutrition is roaring right up to the top. Yeah, that, that leaf is a sink, right? It's not taking in new nutrition. It's, it's just extra. So it's, it's just extra, right. And so to move that... Yeah, you have to move that nutrient in there. So again, this is a uh, magnesium deficiency with James was talking about that, that um, early October pH and low EC. This is one of the, 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 the problems you'd run into in those, um, you know, going from September to November window, uh, late September through mid part of October, low EC, especially if the pH is climbing, this is going to be one of your common results, especially on the darker red color. Nitrogen deficiency, classic, you know, you just turned down. We, we, we conserved our feed a little too early, right? Um, and, and typically this will show up even in the growing tips or the higher point leaves, right? Up in the plant. At the, um, at the, at the end, I think that that's one of the reasons why this picture is, is, is was important. And I talked to the, the gentleman, a, a Italian researcher that took this photograph and I said, that almost looks like magnesium. magnesium. He says, that is a poinsettia that's starved at the very end. He says, what's happening is, is I said, well, why isn't it the, the bottom leaves turning yellow? He says, because the plant's only working at the top. It's, it, though it looks like it's a, cation, a heavy cation deficiency, because the plant is stealing it from the closest leaves. So you can, that is basically the look of a, just I'm not feeding enough in the end. Whereas the magnesium has a much more specific interchlorosis look. But that was a fun conversation with the researcher that did this and how we achieved that look with nitrogen. And that is basically, he says, I stopped feeding him nitrogen in the end of October and none through November, zero in the feed. And this is what you get. Yeah, nitrogen, uh, just from a basic biology level, uh, you're developing new cells. Nitrogen is the primary thing, plants need it. So yep. keep feeding it on there. Um, calcium deficiency is another one. And this is, you know, the classic, you know, bract edge burn where, you know, uh, the newer genetics, it, typically, if you're feeding a, a good balanced feed of a 17 by 17 with calcium, you don't need to apply uh, or apply as regularly uh, any additional calcium overhead. As growers, we always like insurance. We only have one shot for this. So I would never tell a grower not to spray calcium on anything because if it makes you feel better and sleep better at night, hey, do it because you only have one shot at this. I would agree. I think the, 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 the calcium scenario is tied to a specific set of environments, basically uh, dirt floor type environments, even, even if on benches. But really what it goes back to what we talked about earlier is that transpiration stream. It's the humidity, light challenge you Without transpiration, these heavy cations don't move up to the tops. So and I would say, yeah, it, it, it's an insurance policy to apply a calcium. And these bracts are, are special, right? They're not true leaves. So their rates of transpiration, even in the bracts, are reduced. Yep. Right? So if you have a high humidity around the bracts, not only do you have uh, a potential disease uh, situation, you have reduced calcium going into that bract, which can lead to this burn. And I think you just hit something that's a very important point that we didn't hit earlier, 
and you said uh, the high humidity around this BRAC. And that is the, so important to realize is that by the time the BRACs are forming, you've created a, a closed canopy or a near closed canopy. You've created microclimate and there tends to be a humid bubble around that plant unless you have a lot of HAF moving. Your humidity is going to be worse there on the BRAC than what you see um, out in, on, on a you know, sensor. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, we talk a lot about climate and climate control, but we, you know, in a plant, in a nice picture like this here, you have the top microclimate and then you have the dense canopy and you have two different kind of microclimates in an individual large pot. And then you have the greater climate of the whole greenhouse and the crop itself. Um, this is a picture I think that everybody should screenshot just for reference. Um, you know, it, that you have it on your phone. It's a wonderful kind of what is my poinsettia doing deficiency sort of model here. Uh, and we were lucky enough to, you know, borrow this from an Italian researcher uh, that Gary is buddies with. But, it, you know, you're going to see that what we've talked about, the calcium deficiency, the boron deficiency, and the top parts of the plant and the leaves in the bract. Then we have in the middle of it, we have our more of our magnesium and our copper deficiency. Uh, which can, you know, the mid ground. Um, and then your dead middle, you're having your iron, uh, manganese, and zinc, more of your metals, right? And then at the bottom is typically where you're going to see your nitrogen deficiency, your phosphorus deficiency, and uh, your potassium deficiencies. But you can also at your bottom get your toxicities, right? So when you're boron, boron and your manganese. And just, just for reference, poinsettias, um, like a lot of crops, can be sensitive to low pH and, and a, um, um, uh, an aggressively minor package, and you end up with iron manganese toxicity on poinsettias. So that can happen like you see on a geranium or a marigold. It can happen if your pH is really low. And I saw some pretty good examples of it this year where lime system failed. And um, you can see it clear as bell. You know, pH is below 5. It's, it's clear. It's very... Uh, distinct. Interesting point that you brought up with the Lyme cistern failure. Um, we have a lot of people that are using newer medias, right? Mm -hmm. And some of those medias have different buffering capacities. Um, I know I've gotten a couple questions of people, for example, using uh, a higher pine tree substrate or hydrofiber rate, mm -hmm. typical. So keep in mind that you're reducing your buffering capacity when you increase that sort of percentage and, and relative to the amount of peat that you have in your media. Mm -hmm. And therefore you can have a little bit uh, wider range of swings in your pH up and down. Yeah, I think it's, 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 it's important to kind of notate that we've kind of become peat like people just because it's, it's the resource we had and it's what we chose and we built our, our nutrition regimes around it. But we've mm -hmm. always been, um, you know, blessed with the fact that peat is very acidic and we've had to put a fair amount of lime, calcium and magnesium, limestones, into these, um, you know, dolomite and, and such, into the, the media to compensate for that buffering of, of acidity. But it's also been a really nice slow release source of calcium and magnesium for us. As we go into these more neutral components, we have A, we've lost the buffering capacity of the peat to keep the pH down. We're putting less lime in because of that. So there's less calcium and magnesium in the soil. So we have to make sure that we have plenty of calcium and magnesium in our liquid feed regime. But guess what? They tend to push the pH up. So it forces you, it's not undoable by any means. Don't get me wrong, it's great products. But it makes oh, yeah. you rethink. You gotta rethink how you structure and organize your feed regime based on the fact that, that you have a, a very different chemistry in that medium.